Okay, the parsha begins Akiv. So we had mentioned yesterday, Rashi had explained that it could have said, Voyo im tishmun, and if you will listen, what's the Akiv? Akiv is referring to the heel, that if a person attends even to the mitzvahs which are normally neg neglected, then he will merit all the, the brocha of Hashem at the most advanced level. So the Balaturim had said the letters Akev and Keva are the same letters. Meaning that if you if the Torah is the primary and everything else is secondary, only to facilitate that, this is when you merit the Brocha. But when do you see the Torah to be primary? That's only if you have that special level of humility. Because Akev is also referring to, to the to humility that if you have humility and you're not the focus of your life in terms of you to attend to your material needs, then Torah becomes primary. That's keva. That's the Balat Turim. Over here, there are a number of interpretations of Archaim HaKadosh says beautiful things. He asks, it could have said, Im ekipti, what's v'hoyo? The word v'hoyo seems to be totally superfluous. And if v'hoyo See, sites from the Medrash, whenever it says Vahoyo, it's an expression of joy, simcha. Vahoyim take it, Vahoyim ek it tishmun. What is it referring to? So if you have Orachai Makarsh, which Mark, you don't have in your Chumash, he explains it this way. That Moshe Benu is sharing with Klau Yisrael. What happens in person? We have an obligation to observe all 248 mitzvahs which have relevance to us, which all don't. There's a mitzvah which has relevance only to a Kohen, the mitzvah which has relevance only to Israel, the mitzvah has relevance to a Levi, but all the mitzvahs that you're obligated to be, to be observed. You know, very often we rest on our laurels and we believe we're in a good place, but factually, we haven't really addressed many things which we believe we're in a good place. Akev always means the end. Only when you've achieved and you've addressed all the your obligation, then you could you could rejoice. People that are rejoicing too soon in life. I've become this. You know, it's interesting. We find that the Torah tells us that what was the see Noah and Avram Avinu? Regarding Avram Avinu, says, Esa lokim isalich Noach. Esa lokim isalich Noach. Noach needed God's assistance. He couldn't do it on his own. Avram Avinu was at a level he was self-motivated. God, he didn't need God's assistance to be able to achieve what he did. Why? You understand that most people, what motivates them? Most people are motivated by the bell curve comparing to where is everybody else and where am I? Once you're far ahead of the pack, so to say, most people plateau. What motivates you to continue? Because comparatively speaking, relatively speaking, there are many people at your level. But once you're beyond that level, then a person plateau, plateaus. What about a person who's self-motivated? The, the surrounding environment is no relative. He has his eye on the prize. And he knows what he has to achieve. Until he achieves that, he's not satisfied. He continuously advances until he achieves that, whatever he's meant to achieve. Avram Avinu understood what he had to achieve. As a result of that, he never plateaued. Avram Avinu, every moment was another level of advancement. Noah, on the other hand, he was Sadiq B'Torosov. He was a man, he surpassed his generation endless times over. Once he reached that level, he was no longer motivated. As a result of that, he needed that assistance from God to keep him going. Otherwise, he would have actually plateaued. And once you plateau, instead of going forward, you regress, you go backwards. Okay, that's the Chazal. Similar with ourselves. We feel versus most, we're far ahead of the pack. Very few people know, have the knowledge. The person has accomplishes they have spiritually speaking. What happens? We're ready to rejoice. No, you're ready to, you know, person's ready to say, Suda Sodo, not so quick. That's why you, oh, even Akev Tishmon, 
if you're already you've achieved, you're holding by the end, by the end, and you only know that really at the end of your, your life. Only at the end of your, your life do you know what you've achieved and what you haven't achieved. And you've given it, given it your wherewithal, whatever you could, then you, then you can rejoice. And he cites the Chos al Vavos. The Chos al Vavos says that certain people who are exceptional tzaddikim, outwardly, they're always glowing and smiling. But in, inwardly, they're always worried that maybe they haven't met the goal and the level of expectation that they're meant to achieve. So mind-wise, they're ecstatic in terms of what they've accomplished. But in reality, they really don't know if they're where they should be. Therefore, they're always striving to do more. That's the Chobos of Vavos. That's from Olay Ekev Tishmon. That's that's another interpretation. Another interpretation she has: when you study Torah, you should study it in a state of joy. Okay, because since the Torah itself is the ultimate, if a person doesn't appreciate its value, it doesn't have the effect. And he says, "What's the joy of Torah? It's an un- unbelievable thing. Everything else." You achieve something, so the level of achievement is what you've achieved. When you study Torah, we say this is the ultimate mitzvah, Gorer's mitzvah. Right? It says, when you do one mitzvah, it engenders another mitzvah. The Torah itself, which encompasses the Torah, the Torah's entirety. Talmud Torah, Kenegit when you study Torah, when Ekev Tishmon, when you study Torah and you study it, you have to realize the value of what you're doing. You're engaging in something which is all encompassing, which it what it generates, its value is infinite. Therefore, you're ready, as they say, you can already count your profits in advance, knowing what this will bring about. There's no Rachel Kodesh in um Parshas uh, Joseph Rocha. Moshe Rabbeinu says, Smar Zum Zvulun, we know Yaakov set up a, a relationship between Yisoch and Zvulun that Zvulun was responsible for all the material needs of, of Yisrochar. And Moshe Rabbeinu says to Zvulun, when you go out on your sea voyages to earn the money that you need to support Zvulun, Yisrochar, you should already rejoice. Why? Because you're going to, to support Yisrochar who's already sitting in the tents of Torah. Therefore, you should rejoice. You should feel Exceptionally fortunate. That's the Chazal. Smar zun tzeisecha. Why? Because Yisochar ba'olecha. Because Yisochar is in the tent of Torah. So Rechaim Eshet has a question. Whenever a person goes out on any business venture, if you succeed, there's what to, to rejoice. But if you don't succeed, you don't rejoice. So on the way back that you've already done the deal, we understand. Moshe says, Smar zun tzeisecha. Swollen, you could already rejoice when you're going out to, to do the venture business venture. So we ask, but you don't know if you're going to succeed. So how do you rejoice in advance? That's the Orchai Makodesh's question. So Orchai Makodesh says, it's a known fact. Factually, if a person goes out in any endeavor, if it's for the sake of Torah, you'll definitely succeed. Not even a question. You will succeed. Therefore, Moshe says to Zvulin, Svachum Secha. You'll say, but maybe I'm not going to come back with a profit. You have a right to rejoice because if you're going for that reason, Hashem will give you that assistance that you definitely will succeed. When you study Torah, you study with joy. Why? Because this itself is a win, 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 endless it's over. Because whatever you do, there's no such thing. It's for what? It's 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 an exercise of futility. There's no futility. That's from a volume Akiv Tishmun. If you go and with Simcha and you study Torah, you should already not study. You should be with Simcha when you study because the value, there's nothing comparable to what its value is. That's the other interpretation of the Orachim of Kodesh over here. I always say, if a person believes in the Yud Gimel Ikre Amuna, the 13th tense of Jewish belief, we believe in Scharvonish. That's one of the 13 tenets of Jewish belief. Ruin punishment. It tell, we read in Pirkei Ovos, Schar that a mitzvah has such innate value, as long as you live in this world, there's not, not enough time 
and you don't have a capacity that you can receive the reward for even one mitzvah. Okay? If that is the case, and we believe in that, and we want punishment, so why don't we engage and invest ourselves only in doing mitzvahs, studying Torah? Why not? If that's the reality. And it is a reality, and we believe it. The answer is, of course, as Rabbi Shoslanta says, the furthest distant distance in this existence is between the brain and the heart. We understand things abstractly, intellectually, but to internalize it, to sense it, as we sense other things with our senses, we don't. As though that there's always the struggle between the physicality of the person, we're craving for certain things, we feel we need certain things, and the abstract, which we understand, but nevertheless, it's always a tug of war. And that's what choice is, free choice. But in the, in the reality, what we do believe, there's nothing comparable to it. And therefore, everything else pales. With, it's an understatement to, to, to Torah mitzvahs. But yet, that's not the way we live our lives. But if a person really hooks into it, and you actually are able to internalize its value, I'll give you an example. Very often, you know, a person feels he's not interested in learning. But he says, you know, and he forces himself and he sits and studies. Goes to a shir. After he goes to that shir, after he learns, he doesn't regret it for a moment. And he's happy that he invested the time in that. But that's only after fact. Before he had, it wasn't so simple. Many years ago, there was a person who's no longer alive. He was a Turkish Jew. And um, he was a bachelor, didn't get married. He was a Wall Street person. And I said to him, I said, I want to ask you a question. Uh, do you own a pair of tefillin? He was raised in Turkey in a secular home with those parents who were Sephardic Jews. He says, no. I, I said, if I buy you a pair of tefillin, would you put them on? And he could afford the tefillin easily. And um, he says, definitely I'll put them on. Okay. I said, but you really have to put them on every day. He said, well, there's sometimes I'll be in the office early. I'm, I may not be able to put them on. I said, okay, try do your best. So I meet him a few weeks later after I get him to the film. I said, um, how often do you put them on? He says, not very often. Very few times. Because I've been in the office early. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, the few times you put on the film, I want to buy the mitzvah from you. The value of that mitzvah, I'd like to buy it for you. I said, are you willing to sell it? He says, no. I said, what about if I give you $1,000 for the one time you put on film? You sell for $1,000? He says, no. What about $10,000? No. So I said, let me ask you a question. When you have to be in the office early, are you going to make $10,000 during that hour you can be there earlier and you pass it on to fill in? He says, probably not. Most times not. So if here you have the mitzvah. You're not willing to sell for $10,000. But to get to the office an hour early, we're probably, you're not going to make even a fraction of that. In that hour, that's the reason why you don't put on filling. I say, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. That's exactly what we're talking about. After you do it, we appreciate its value. But when again, we, we approach it again, it's not simple. You got that struggle. I have this, I have that. And then after again, unless you internalize it, that it's always like you sense things with your senses, the sense its value, it's always a struggle. Unless you're conditioned to do it, without the conditioning, it's always iffy, whether it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. Any question, Jay? My question is, if you think about Yisachar Zvul and that model, um, I wanted to understand the difference uh, at the, of the level of Simcha, or is it the same for each? For each? Okay. The Chavetz Chaim, there's a famous Chavetz Chaim who says, you know, there's an obligation to know the Torah's entirety. To study it and retain it. Most people don't have the time or the memory to retain Torah, the Torah's entirety. So he suggests that if a person has the financial means and you're able to support multiple colonies where they study, study various tractates, any study of Torah which is due to your financial support, that Torah accrues to you. 
And the Chavetz Chaim says, when you come to Yeshiv Shomala, there's a heavily Torah academy. All the Torah that you generated through your financial support, you will have that knowledge of that Torah when you come to the world to come. That's the Chavetz Chaim. So the person, of course, has the personal obligation to study. But in addition to that, he supports many different people who study and different subject matters. And it's serious study what he supports. All that knowledge accrues to him when it comes to the world to come. Okay? So Rav Shach says, even though that may be true, may be true, but as the Chobetz Chaim says, not may, it is true. He says, he says, although he doesn't have much material in this world, Rav Shach lived till 107 years old. He says, one thing I could tell you, the pleasure he has in this world, the wealthiest man who has everything in this world doesn't have the pleasure that he has in this world. But this is Rav Shach, he, he had an innocence of a, of a child. He says, when he has a difficult Rambam and he works on it and agonizes it, on it for weeks, and then he finally comes and he has to understand the Rambam, the level of pleasure he has there's no pleasure in this world which is comparable to that pleasure. This is where Abshach says, there's no material pleasure which is equal to that pleasure. So he says, Yisochah's woman, Yisochah has, has tremendous pleasure in supporting Torah. But the one who's experiencing the study of Torah, it's a whole different reality. Credit-wise, he's accredited. In the world to come, he has the knowledge. Mitzvah-wise, he supported Torah. He's a partner. But in terms of the Simcha of Torah, that Simcha of the Torah, it's not comparable to the one actually is experiencing the Simcha itself. If you observe the mitzvos, the, the bris, the covenant, the chesed, God will love you. So the Baal Turim says each one of these words correspond to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. He will love you because you're reflecting the persona of Avram. Brocha is what? The Brocha, that's Yitzchak, quotes the Pasuk, Virbecha. Uberech is pri bitnocho, pri admosecho. To bless the fruit of your land, your your, your progeny, the gontris yeroshri tsarecho. Now, shkara lofecho vashur semecho. Now, what, what's the meaning of shkara lofecho? Rashi says, shkara lofecho, vlodi bikorcho, the calves of your cattle. Why were they called shkar, shigar, shanakevim shageres mimeo? The female casts it out from its womb. So the calf of a of a female of a cow, it's called shkar alafelto. Shemeshageres mimeo. It casts it out from its womb. Ashur Sunecho, all the, the offspring of your sheep, Aladom Shishma of Sev Lossi Slov. I once asked Rokhaim Kenevsky Zech Tzadik Levrocha Allen, I asked him, we find that after Hashem destroyed the world with the Mabel, with the great flood, Hashem made a covenant with, with existence that he will never destroy the world again. Why? Kiyetzel Lev Odom Ramen Urof. Because the inclination of man is evil from the time he's born. It's supposed to be over there. That's the possum. Therefore, he makes a covenant with existence, he will never destroy the world again. Because the Yetzel Lev Adam, the inclination of the heart of man is Ra, is evil, Minurov. Now, what, is, what does it mean in Minurov? So Rashi cites the Gemara in Sanhedrin over there. Bisheninar Mimei Imo. From the time the child is emptied from the womb of his mother, the evil inclination attaches itself to that child. So therefore, from get-go, the moment the child comes out of the womb of its mother, it's already subject to the influence of the evil inclination. 
As a result of that, therefore, I will not bring, I will not destroy the world again, even if man fails. It's Chaim Konevsky. When we speak about the offspring of a cow, it's called Shkaral of It's called why? Because it's Meshageres Esavlad Mimeo. It casts its offspring from its womb. It, the word is casting. It like throws it out. When it speaks about the human being, why is a child called Na'ar? A Na'ar is a youth. It comes from the word Ninar. Mishininar, when it's empty, when the child is empty from its womb of its mother, it's subject to the evil inclination. So a, a human being is emptied. An animal is cast. That, that's the question I asked from Khan Kanevsky. You know, they say you have an animal that's a year old and the animal that's two years old. What's the difference between the two animals? A year, that's about it. It's the same animal. Just more flesh, more bone as it gets larger. A human being is a whole different reality. When you have something in a vessel of value, what, what is the value? What's in the vessel or the vessel? The value of the vessels to contain what's in the vessel. The womb of the mother, the value is the child that develops in that womb. A human being is emptied from its mother's womb. Now the child's ready for real time. It's emptied, it's nar. Meaning there's an objective, there's a purpose why the child's born. An animal's just cast from its mother's womb. It's cast, it's not emptied. It's like a person has a piece of flesh, you cut a piece of meat, you cut it in half. Now it's two pieces. The animal in its womb, it's the, the offspring is cast from its mother. It's separated from its mother. A child, a human being is not cast. It's emptied. The connotation empty is you have something contained in a vessel. Now it's emptied. But that what's contained has independent value. And now it's ready to function independent. And that's what a human being is about. And what is that about? It's ready for real time because that's when the child is subject to the evil inclination. Of course, life is challenges and the basis for all challenges is, is what we call the evil inclination. That's the basis for Gehira. That That's what I said to him. But what was more important, not what I said, it's, it's the question, why regarding the animal, we say it's cast from the womb and regarding human being, it's emptied from the womb. But not air. The Na'er in Hebrew means to empty. The Malbim says, why is a Nar called a Nar? A youth is called a... So he says, the Malbim says that a child is an empty vessel. It's like an empty vessel, a child. A person doesn't have the experiences of life. You don't have knowledge. It's an empty vessel. But it has a potential, a capacity that you're able to fill that vessel. That's why youth is called a Nar what you call the person is a fool. It's it's a pejorative reference to a person as a fool. He's a nar, right? He's a nar. We find that the Sarah Mashkin, the wine steward, referred to Yosef when he depicted him to uh, the Paro. He's nar ivri, nar evid ivri. He's a fool. Nar is a fool. What is a fool? A fool. He looks. He has looks like a regular human being. Seems to be, but once you hear him speak, you see he's an empty vessel. That's all it is. He's manuar. He's just empty. There's a certain expression in Yiddish. Uh, a lady, a, a pusta keli. Pust means nothing. A desolate vessel, nothing in there. Okay? That's what's called an hour.